Have you ever had one of those days where the number of things that you have to get done are more than the number of hours that's in that day? Do you ever wonder how everything is going to get done in time? On top of that, there's something big that you're stressing about. You're not looking forward to it at all. So your mind is reeling with this list of things that need to be done. All the time, you're stressed to the limit over something else. It's usually at moments like that when everything else goes wrong too. Your kids will start fighting. Your dog takes off and runs away into the night. No matter how much you call them, they don't come back. And you know, betrayal like that always stings when your stress level is already Already higher than you can handle it. Have you ever had days like that before? Well, on Thursday, the 14th of Nisan, AD 30, Jesus was having that kind of day, which led to the longest night in history. There is so much that he has yet to tell his disciples. Basically, everything that John records in his gospel from chapter 13 all the way to chapter 17 is all contained in this one night. The whole time, the crucifixion is weighing heavily on Jesus's mind. He knows the horrors of what is to come. So how can one enjoy a Passover meal? with his friends, knowing that his arrest and his cruel death is just hours away, with so much left to get done as well. Now, Jesus had no children, but sometimes the disciples behaved like that. And you guessed it, they started fighting. Right when everything is going wrong and you're stressed to the max, that's when things like this happen. Jesus just got through saying who is going to betray him. And in Luke's gospel, Luke records this incident in chapter 20. Verses 23 and 24. And they began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. And there arose also a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. Really, boys, we're back on this again. So these grown men are behaving like children, bickering over something that they've fought about for more than a year already. The only thing left from my previous scenario is for the dog to be betray you and run away into the night, right? Well, after identifying Judas Iscariot as his betrayer and dismissing him gracefully without telling the others why, Judas runs off into the dark night to lead the rulers to Jesus and to get his silver. But this all happens on God's timetable. There is no possible way that any human organization could plan and arrange these events with such precision. Even the part about the dog running and away into the night. In John 13, 8, he says, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me, which in the Old Testament was found in Psalm 41, verse 9. That's what Jesus was quoting. To keep Jesus from, or to keep Judas from being able to betray him before the due time, we read in the last study how Jesus said, Peter and John ahead of them to prepare a place for the Passover. And he gave them directions in such a way that nobody who heard this knew where they were going. They didn't even know where they were going until they got there. This way, Judas could not go and give away their location until Jesus' list of things to do was finished, especially fulfilling the old covenant and establishing the new. When they arrived at the upper room, Judas could not get away without suspicion until Jesus later dismissed him, which was right after they fulfilled Psalm 49 1 about the lifting up of the, about the eating of the bread with the one who betrays him. Where we pick up now, the betrayer is gone. The clock is ticking until his arrest. Now Jesus gets down to business. Having fulfilled the prophecy of eating with Judas, Jesus now institutes the Lord's Supper in its place. Now we covered how the Galilean Jews celebrated Passover the day before the Judean people did. Now I mentioned last time that the Galileans had adopted a tradition in the Hebrew that is called Suda Mofseket. This translates essentially 
to Last Supper. The Galileans also marked their days from sunrise to sunrise, while the Judeans measured their sunset to sunset. This allowed Jesus to observe the Passover with his disciples on Thursday in perfect obedience to the law and in order to be the Passover sacrifice on Friday in fulfillment of the law. God has everything laid out in perfect detail and great precision. With Judas, who is like a bad tooth, having been pulled and is now gone, now Jesus makes a change that Judas could not have been a part of. The Passover observance in that upper room became radically different from the traditional observance that they were used to because a change has been made, a transition. That night was the final legitimate Passover and the first communion. The old has gone and the new has come. So let's pick up in Mark chapter 14. We'll begin with verses 22 through 24. While they were eating, he took some bread, and after blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. To begin the transition from the old observance to the new, let's start by examining what the old was. What happens on the night of the Passover and during the meal? Because a lot of people, we don't come from that culture, so we don't really fully understand the order of events that would normally happen on that night. After the lamb is prepared by being fully roasted, it's entirely consumed the first night. Nothing can be left over. Then they have unleavened bread, which they called matzah. It becomes the main staple for the next seven days during the feast that follows that. Then families, they recall the slavery in Egypt during the first half of the night by eating the matzah with bitter herbs, which symbolizes the bitterness of the slavery they were in. And then there was a sweet paste, a dip called kerosene. You can find the recipe for these on Google, and it's actually pretty tasty stuff. But that taste, that paste possibly possibly represented the mortar which the Jewish slaves used to cement the bricks. Now, they recall the freedom of the second half of the night. They eat the matzah, the bread of the freedom, as well as the bread of affliction, and something called a fecumen. It was a dessert, and they drank the four cups of wine that were part of the tradition with that. When the bread is broken into two, some customs have different sayings that are read aloud, such as, in this manner God split the Red Sea, and they would break the bread. The second half of the bread is put up and it becomes dessert. And later on, it's hidden throughout the house for the kids to have fun finding it. So the small ones got involved with this because not only was it a time of remembrance for the adults, it was also a time of learning for the young ones. So they would have fun finding this leftover matzah that was hidden around it, which become dessert. So there was a series of four questions and they were usually asked by the youngest child. And in answering them, the family recites the history of the Exodus. There are four cups of wine, and each one observing a part of the deliverance God provided. The four cups represent the four expressions of deliverance promised by God in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. It says, I will bring out... I will deliver, I will redeem, and I will take you for my people. However, this time in that upper room with Jesus and the disciples, things became radically different. They were likely shocked when Jesus broke the bread, and instead of saying the usual sayings, he said, take it, this is my body. You know, years earlier, Jesus had hinted at this. It was right after the feeding of the 5,000, and he taught about being the bread of life. Many people became upset when he said that, but not as much as when he said this next in John 6, 53. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. That's a hard thing to hear if you don't understand the context of it. The scripture tells us that after that, many people left him and followed him no more. They didn't understand, and I'm not sure the disciples did either until later. 
The first day of the Passover would consist of eating the Passover lamb. Jesus, as John the Baptist proclaimed it so clearly, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is him asserting by saying, take and eat, this is of my body. He is fulfilling the Passover. They have just observed the Passover for the final time legitimately. After the cross, the very next day, it will have been fulfilled. No other lambs would ever be necessary, for Jesus has paid it all. It's time for a new observance. So to make the transition easier for these men who may have only known the traditional Passover their whole lives, he gave them two visual aspects of the new ceremony that comes with the new covenant. Beginning with the bread, we look back, not to the exodus from Egypt as in the days of old, but we look back to the cross at Calvary. There, Jesus fulfilled every prophecy and every requirement concerning the Passover lamb. He became the sacrifice at the appointed time, three o'clock on Friday, the 15th in Nisan, A.D. 30. So now when we take the bread of communion, when we take of the wafer during the Lord's table, we reflect and remember his sacrifice that he made for us that day on the cross. His body had been beaten. His flesh had been ripped to shreds. He was literally nailed to a cross and he agonized there for six hours. Now in the old covenant, the kids would ask what all this observance was about. Why do we eat reclining? Why is, why is this night different than all the other nights? They had their questions. But before partaking of the new covenant and the Lord's table, you should already know. You should be a believer before you partake of the Lord's table. For this is a time of remembrance. Now it says after the cup was passed, you noticed it was a single cup. Obviously there weren't any worries about COVID at this time. After the cup was passed, Jesus again changed everything in meaning and in purpose. Instead of the usual prayer of remembrance of God's deliverance from Egypt, he said of the cup, this is my blood of the covenant. This is when we look back to his blood being shed on the cross. It was poured out for many, as he said in verse 24, as many as will receive him by faith. This is his blood of the covenant. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Back in Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned, God killed an animal to clothe them. That was the first time humanity ever saw blood being shed. Their son Abel sacrificed an animal to God, which was a blood sacrifice. Cain brought an offering that was rejected. Cain tried to come to God his own way, not the way that God had shown his parents. For thousands of years, God's people sacrificed animals for blood offerings. Blood was even to be smeared on the doorpost every Passover. But all of that blood for all of those thousands of years did not save one single person. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 3 and 4. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. What it was was a reminder of the awful cost of sin, and it was also a foreshadow of the Messiah, the Lamb of God, and the day that after Jesus instituted this new table to replace the old Passover meal, Jesus would pay the way for us in the new covenant when his blood was poured out for many. The focus was no longer on the suffering of Israel in Egypt, but now on the sin-bearing suffering that Jesus endured on our behalf. So here is the literal dividing line between the Old and the New Testaments. You might think, now wait a minute, Rick, in my Bible, the Old Testament ends with Malachi 4.6, and the New Testament begins with Matthew 1.1. But actually, right here is the dividing line. We might say, well, the other one is the dividing between the Old and the New Testaments. This is the dividing between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Gospels, which we're reading now and which we're studying, were written at a later date, and they were describing things that happened during the time of Jesus. But right here, they are describing the scene of the cross when the transaction was made and when the transition was made. That night in the upper room with the disciples was the last legitimate Passover ceremony. The next day, Jesus fulfilled everything, everything that the children of Israel had 
had observed for the last 1,500 years. Now, can you still eat it today? That's probably the, the thing that's bugging you the most. Maybe you've had this question in the back of your mind. If you want to eat a lamb that's roasted with bitter herbs, that's up to you. If you want to eat matzah or unleavened bread with a carouset dip, that's up to you. Personally, I had some the last week just so my children can kind of experience and understand and taste the things that we were talking about when I taught this study in our church. But you must understand by observing observing this thing, that it means nothing to God. His son Jesus paid for all of our sins upon the cross. He fulfilled this. This is no longer necessary. If you wish to remember the deliverance from Egypt, that's fine. After I did so with my children, we watched the old cartoon, The Prince of Egypt, and we would pause it occasionally and explain to them and show them in the scripture where these things happen. So if you wish to do this just as an experience or to remember deliverance from Egypt, that's fine. But know that Jesus Jesus' blood did what 1,500 years of lambs could not. Jesus atoned for our sins. As the, the song says, the hymn says, he washed it white as snow. He didn't just wash us light pink, and we still have more to do. Jesus paid it all, and observing any of these feasts will not save you. Yet only faith and trust in Christ and repenting from your sins. Now, with that being said, some people have a hard time grasping this. They refer to the verse in Exodus that says the Passover will never be completely gone. Well, let's just go ahead and bring it up on the screen. Exodus 12, 14. Now, it, it, this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. So is the Passover abolished since it's been fulfilled? Think of it now as being paused. Think of it as being put on hold. Remember, his death brings in the church age. We are now under his new covenant that he instituted at the Lord's table and paid for at the cross. We're under the new covenant. We're covered in Jesus's blood. He paid for our sins, and no animal sacrifices or no amount of works will gain us favor with God. But the Passover isn't finished yet. It's been put on hold by the only one who has the authority to change anything. So let us look at what the Son of God has to say about this. Let's continue on in Mark 14 and cover verse 25. Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Looking at Mark's gospel alone, you might think that this verse was just referring to the drinking of wine. But let us also look at the others in harmony for a complete meaning. In Luke 22, verses 15 and 16, And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Or we'll hop over to Matthew 26, 29. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So will there ever be another Passover? There will. He just confirmed that in his own words, in the 1,000-year millennial reign of Christ on earth. Now, John MacArthur, I've quoted him quite a bit throughout these studies, and he talked in great detail about this. And he said, and I quote, the prophet Ezekiel gives a picture of the millennial worship. In Ezekiel 40 through 48, the whole section is a picture of millennial worship, the worship of Christ and the kingdom to come. In chapter 45, verses 21 through 25 describe the celebration of Passover. There will be, will be a temple built in the millennium. There will be a Passover held at that time in the millennial kingdom, not as a memorial to the Exodus, but as a memorial to the cross and to the true lamb. So just like the Israelites would look back in remembrance to them being delivered from Egypt by God's mighty hand when they observed the Passover, Christians today are called to observe a new covenant. We look back to the cross and what our Savior accomplished there. There, Jesus fulfilled the Passover. He fulfilled the law. 
He fulfilled the sacrificial system. He defeated Satan. He defeated death. And he paid the way for us to be with him in eternity. As he said in John chapter 14, no man comes unto the Father but through him. Let's continue on in Mark 14 and get verse 26. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That night was full of radical changes for these disciples. They weren't expecting this radical shift from a tradition that they've observed since they were the little children asking the four traditional questions. They most definitely were not ready for the events that are going to take a place just a few hours later that night from where we are. But there was one thing, one thing from the old Passover traditions that was remaining, singing of a psalm. Now, unlike modern churches with our hymnals, the Hebrews sang psalms. That is their hymnal. Look in your Bible if you want a Hebrew hymnal and read the book of Psalms. Yes, it doesn't rhyme. I don't know why we think that songs have to rhyme, but also that things could be changed in the translation over into our language. But that is their hymnal. And the Passover meal always ended with the singing of three different psalms known as the Hillel, which were Psalms 116 through 118. Now, David Guzik from Enduring Word said, and I quote, when Jesus arose to go to Gethsemane, Psalm 118 was upon his lips. It provided an appropriate description of how God would guide his Messiah through distress and suffering to glory. Now, I don't have time to read that entire psalm to you, but we should read all three of these on our own time just to get a feel for what was sung that final night before the crucifixion. The disciples who would soon face persecution needed to hear such verses as verse 6 out of Psalm 118. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? They needed to hear this. They needed to focus on the coming kingdom that Jesus is going to purchase with his sacrifice. Psalm 118 verse 19, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. And then the two verses later on in Psalm 118 were the same two that the crowds chanted during his triumphal entry into Jerusalem just a few days prior. Verse 22, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Verse 26, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. When they were shouting Hosanna, this is what they were quoting. Though confused by the new elements that Jesus taught that night, I'm sure the disciples' hearts were full of joy as they sang leaving the upper room. They've never really latched on to what Jesus has spent the last three years telling them that he is going to be handed over. He is going to be killed, and he will rise on the third day. They've never got that into their heads. That means that what Jesus said next is going to shock them to their core. I think they still didn't even realize it that by now, and they were just mere minutes away from Jesus being arrested. So let's go ahead and get verses 27 through 31. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing also. Jesus began this discourse with both old prophecy and new. I say old and new because the old prophecy was something written 500 years before by the prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah 13, 7, he predicted the something that Jesus said that was going to happen. And within minutes of it happening, he predicts the fulfillment. Once Jesus is arrested, they scatter. Every time that Jesus had earlier predicted his death, he always mentioned the resurrection too. Those always went hand in hand, and that is no different here. So we get the new prophecy. Right after telling them that he would be killed and they would scatter, just like Zechariah predicted, he told them in verse 28 of Mark 14, but after I have been erased, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. 
After his burial, these guys didn't know what to do with themselves. Some of them hid in the upper room with the door locked out of fear of the crowds. Some returned to what they knew before, fishing. That's what, what else are we going to do? But when the women came to the tomb that Sunday morning, what was it that the angel told them? In Matthew 28, 7, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Well, Jesus told them as well. After I come back, I will meet you guys in Galilee. Instead of asking just one more time about clarification over this coming back from the grave thing, they once again fought against the idea of Jesus dying. They didn't get it. Mary Magdalene got it when she anointed him for burial with the spike nerd, but these chosen students, these close followers, these prized students of the rabbi didn't get it. In verse 29, we see Peter being quick not only to boast about his dedication to Christ, but he also threw the others under the bus, so to speak, didn't he? In Mark 14, 29, Peter said to him, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. Let me give you some insight into the male ego to understand where Peter is coming from. Ladies, it's easier for men to do great things than to do small things. When your husband says he will do anything for you, we mean like fighting dragons and bears and glamorous things like that. We're not talking about washing dishes and vacuuming the carpet. Now, men, that's no reason to try to get out of these things, but I'm just saying. Most teenage boys, they're courageous when it comes to getting rid of a pest in the house, whether it's a bird, scorpion, rat, or even a snake. I mean, a teenage boy will usually jump right on that. But if you ask them to take out the trash or clean the room, oh no, I just can't do it. You know, Peter is ready for something big. He is ready for a sword fight. And that's going to be evident in our next study as Peter truly is the only one ready to fight, just like he said he was here. But the hardest thing for a man to do is the small thing. Things. Swinging a sword and fighting against a Roman contingent, yeah, that's courageous. But that is easy compared to sitting by idly and letting these Roman soldiers carry your Lord and Master away to a cruel death. That was too difficult for Peter. It's the little things that are the hardest to do. Once the trial had begun, people are going to start to associate Peter with Jesus, who was being condemned. And again, it's easier to fight 200 centurions than to simply acknowledge that, hey, I belong to Jesus amongst this hostile crowd. So many times I hear people say that they would never denounce their faith. I would never deny Christ, even if someone pointed a gun at my head. And you know, they might be right about that part, but who really knows the extent of your bravery when you've never been tested to that extreme before? You don't know what you're made of unless you have been through this. But you know, denial can come in many other forms. We may not deny Christ if we're placed in a life or death situation, or at least I hope we don't, but how many times in a given week do we deny Christ with the little things? How many times have we denied Christ by our actions, by the words that we say, by the things that we do, by the things that we don't do? The people sitting around the fire recognize Peter as being a Galilean who was with Jesus by his speech. I've seen many people who call themselves Christians that you would never recognize they're a believer by listening to them, by listening to the things that come out of their mouth. Peter was confident in his loyalty to Christ. He truly believed that he would never deny him. But Jesus knew Peter far better than Peter did. And he knows you better than you know yourself. That's why we're warned so many times in Scripture about boasting, about overconfidence. Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Our next study is going to take us to Gethsemane, where we're going to see Jesus spending his final free hours with the Father in prayer, or final free minutes, I should say. He spends it in prayer with the Father. And then we're going to see his betrayal 
and we're going to see his arrest. And it is there where we will see the true colors of these valiant men who said in verse 31, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. The verse says that they were all saying that, not just Peter. Everyone says, I will not deny you. I will not leave you. Well, let's just go ahead and look and see how that goes in our next study.